Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are in, uh, gosh, we're up to part 11 for the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles. We uh, ended right here at the beginning of, what is this, chapter 46. Uh, if you don't learn anything else from this study, I guess you'll learn how to read Roman numerals. So, uh, 46, Mashiach acknowledged the Eloa of the Yahudim. So also our master, who wrought signs and wonders, preached the, uh, preached the Yahuwah of the Yahudim, and therefore we are right in believing what he preached. But as for you, even if you were really a Navi and performed signs and wonders as you promised to do, if you were to announce other, uh, other Elohim besides him who is the true Elohim, it would be manifest that you were raised up as a trial for the people of Yahuwah, and therefore you can by no means be believed. For he alone is the true Yahuwah, uh, who is the Elohim of the Yahudim. And for this reason, our master Yeshua HaMashiach did not teach them that they must inquire of Yahuwah, for him they knew well already, but that they must seek his Mahuth and righteousness, which is the Supreme and the Purushim. Uh, having received the key of knowledge, is shut it in. Uh, had not shut it in, but shut out. For if they had been ignorant of the true Elohim, surely he would have never left the knowledge of this thing, which is the chief of all, and blame them for small and little things, as for enlarging their fringes, and claiming the uppermost rooms in the feast, and praying standing in the hallway in the highways, and such like things, which assuredly, in comparison of this great charge, uh, the ignorance of Yahuwah, uh, seem small and ignorant and significant matters. Okay, so um Let's see here, where to start. Um, so let's start this. Um, even if you were really a Navi, really a prophet, and performed signs and wonders as you promised to do, so you speak into Simon Magus, if you were to announce other Elohim besides him as the true Elohim, it would be manifest that you were raised up as a trial for the people of Yahuwah. So... So, you know, uh, and I, I kind of hate to keep coming back to this, but, you know, it, we got to at least bring it up that if Simon Magus is a stand-in for Paul, which I believe he is, um, you know, people will say something to the effect of, well, you know, if he was, the, if he was uh, a false apostle, if he was a false, you know, prophet, then surely Yahuwah would not have let him into the canon of Scripture. And here we see why he would. It is to be a test for the people. So, let's talk about that matter for just a moment. Here's something that I hear from people quite often. Is, you know, do you not think that... Yahuwah is so powerful that he can control what goes into the Bible. You know, and they always say it with this whole, like, you know, big flourish of words. Do you not think that he's capable? Do you not think that he's sovereign? Does, are you saying that his arm is so short that he can't control what King James put in the Bible? And, you know, the answer is yes. I do think he's strong enough to be able to do that. However, you know, you're mixing up ability with necessity, you know, or ability with, you know, the, the question is not can he, the question is would he? So, you know, why would he allow a false, a false apostle, a false, false prophet or whatever to make their way into scripture? It's simple, it's a test for the people. Um, and, you know, I, I say it all the time, that the people, the Messianic believers, they're already Jamesian. You know, they, they have essentially Jamesian understanding, which is that you, you are to be a doer of the Torah. You're to do the Torah and you keep the testimony. So, do I think that Yahuwah is capable of, of editing his book the way he wants? I think he's capable of it. 
but because he is sovereign, he can choose to do whatever he wants. You know, I mean, there there has been. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever read read the uh, the book New Age Bible Versions, this the lady who wrote the book, a very thorough, very in depth book, and she talks about how um, Westcott and Hort in the late nineteenth century. Uh, corrected, and I use that word in you know in air quotes, corrected the Greek text of the New Testament, and they went through and they essentially edited out the. They used demonography and channeling and such to edit out the the parts that they didn't like. So let's say you've got a hundred Greek manuscripts for a particular particular verse, and 95 of them match perfectly with each other, and then you've got these other five that two of them match with one another, one of them is something completely different, and the other two are missing the verse or whatever. You know, so there's um, a minority of the text that differ from the majority text. Um, and then this Textus Receptus was a text that that was basically the received text that had all the majority understanding for those 95 uh, Greek texts. What West Court, Hot and Hort did is they went through and they took all the minority texts and they incorporated them into their own uh, document. And so they said that that was the corrected um, Greek text. And so, a lot of these New Age Bible versions, they don't officially use a Westcott and Hort text, but what they do is they, they use the minority text that Westcott and Hort did, and um, so your Bible version that you have now, like if you have an NIV or NASV or whatever that's made with a, um, a different text from the Textus Receptus, it's, it's got these um, additions and subtractions, and uh, actually it's quite a bit of Quite a bit has been taken out of the Bible. Well, the uh, the lady that wrote that book, New Age Bible Versions, to expose this, she also pointed out the number of editors that were on these Bible um, translating teams, like the NIV, and it's just dozens of people completely lost the ability to speak. Um, you know, one way or another. They didn't all lose it in the same way, but essentially it's like, yeah, Yahuwah, you know, he, he meted out his vengeance for changing the word. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to send an angel down from heaven to to stop someone from, from making the changes. You know, those people went ahead and made the changes. You have, Many people have an NIV on, the, on their bookshelf. You can go into a Bible store and you'll see the NIV. Um. Did he did he mete out vengeance for that? Yes, he punished the people for doing it, but he didn't stop them. That Bible version's out there, still out there. It's probably the best selling Bible version um, in the world right now. So, can he do it? Yes, I thoroughly believe he could do it. I believe he could <clears throat> send a, an angel to my my doorstep tonight, and that angel could could have in his hands a perfectly translated copy of all the scriptures that Yahuwah wants us to have written in perfect English with the correct translation, the most accurate translation possible in the universe. He could do that. But is he going to do that? And that's the question. Like That's what they meant. That's, that's, the, real, that's the real argument to make. Would Yahuwah use his sovereign might to prevent people from changing his word. No, I mean, I think if you're bound and determined that you're going to corrupt his word, I don't think he's going to hit you with a lightning bolt. He might. He might choose to do it. Um, but I don't know that he's going to. I don't think that he will. You know, Yahuwah doesn't usually work that way where, um, you know, the, the exodus out of Egypt where he worked, you know, massive signs and wonders and plagues and thunderstorms and hail and hurricanes and all this stuff to get his people out of Egypt, that's the exception. That's not the way he normally works. The way Yahuwah normally works is through that still small voice. 
and it's through influencing you and through speaking to you as an individual and 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 moving people in that way. But even then, you know, when he speaks to you and 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 uh, tries to influence you to do a certain thing, you don't usually see you who are coming down. Like if you don't listen, it's not like he sends an angel to grab you by the by this you know scruff of the neck and put you where he wants you to go. If you choose to ignore him, then he pretty much will just dismiss himself from your life. Um, so, you know, don't fall into that error of thinking that just because something's in the Bible that it's inspired or that it's infallible. I mean, if we were going to say that in the original, uh, you know, 1611 or whatever version of the Bible was put out, there was a... Um, a preface to the Bible, an introduction to the Bible that was written by King James himself. That was in the Bible. Was that inspired? <laughs> you know, I mean, where are we going to draw the line? Um, you know, a lot of people reject Enoch and say it's not inspired. Well, guess what? Enoch was in the Bible. The first King James Bible produced had the Apocrypha in it. Why would you say that's not inspired? Um, and so I'm not arguing for the Apocrypha. I'm not saying it should be inspired. I'm just saying, look, it's um, just being in a book. Being, you know, the, the Bible was picked by the Catholic Church. You know, that's where it came from. You know, the, 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 the first canon, the first canon that, that we had came from Marcion, who was, you know, known as the greatest heretic. But the first church canon we had came from the Catholic Church. So whose authority are you given to determine what is true scripture and what is not? You know, why don't we just go back to keeping Sunday if we're going to put ourselves under the authority of the church and not question it? And that's basically what you're doing. I mean, I don't think Paul's writings are inspired. I think that they are... I think that they're... Um, valuable for historical references because he does talk about James and the other apostles and, and things of that nature. But, I mean, he doesn't quote Yeshua. There's only two times in all of his letters that you could say that he, he even paraphrases Yeshua. But he never quotes him. He, he tells you very little, if anything, about Yeshua's life and ministry. Um, he doesn't say, you know, it's like the Master said this time. And, you know, like you see here in, in this uh, Nazarene Acts, Peter is constantly quoting Yeshua, but you never hear of Paul quoting Yeshua. You know, there is a couple of times you could you could argue that he paraphrases him, but he never quotes him. Um, many of his doctrines run contrary to what Paul says, and people try to to make Paul say the opposite of what he's actually saying. And but here's the thing: if if Paul says two sentences. And it takes you a five-hour YouTube video, or no, I won't say that, a, an hour-long YouTube video with, you know, 34 other scriptures and, and quotes from different church fathers and stuff to, get all, to make Paul's message say the exact opposite of what it says in plain, you know, plain English as translated from the Greek. Then guess what? Paul may not be saying what you're trying to make him say. If it takes you an hour to explain two sentences, why, why is that? Should that be necessary? No. Is anything in the Nazarene Acts really all that difficult to understand? No. None of this is hard to understand. There are no you know, uh, theological gymnastics taking place in the Nazarene Acts. It's all straightforward. It's plainly written. It's, it's the exact opposite of what I see in Paul's letters. And and on, honestly, Paul's letters are contradictory. You know, he'll he'll talk about how the law is a curse, and then every now and then he'll throw in this whole, but you know, we need to uphold the law, or you know, or the you know, do I'm not saying the law is a curse? Certainly not. Well, yeah, you are. You you just spent you know ten pages saying that it's a curse, and then one line says that it's not, and everybody focuses on that one line. Why do you think he put that in there? He put that in there. So that people who would try to call him out and say that he, he's saying what he's actually saying, 
He, he it gives implausible not deniability. That's all that is. Um. So anyway. So, um. So Yahuwah does, you know, raise up prophets to be a test. We see that from Deuteronomy chapter 13. Uh, so, and he's saying that Yahuwah, that Yahuwah is the Elohim of the Yahudim. Okay, why is my highlighter not working? And for that reason, Yahuwah never taught them that they had to inquire over after Yahuwah. They didn't, you know, Yeshua didn't appear to them to introduce them to Yahuwah. They already knew Yahuwah. Um, you know, so we're still talking about the subject of this di uh, discussion right here is about Simon, the magician, saying that there was another Elohim above Yahuwah that was superior to Yahuwah the Creator and that that's who Yeshua came to to speak to the people about, to, to introduce them or to make them aware of the person, of the being that's above the Creator. And, and Peter's saying, no, that's not true, because Yeshua, you know, Yeshua, <laughs> Yeshua never mentions anything about um, this unknown Elohim, um, which is proof that the, that the Jewish believers, that the Jews already knew Yahuwah. Um, but rather he said that they must seek his kingdom and his righteousness and righteousness which the scribes and the Pharisees having received the key of knowledge had shut in had not shut in but shut out. So basically they, uh, the, the word of Yahuwah had been hidden from the people and, ch and corrupted and changed. And we're going to get into that later. But there was a belief among the Nazarenes that the lying pen of the scribes had corrupted the scriptures. And that's what Peter's alluding to here. So, so again, it comes back to this whole question about, you know, why would Yahuwah let Paul's writings in if Paul wasn't inspired? Well, you can see here it's been done before. Um, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees did it prior to Yeshua's coming, and the Catholic Church has done it post Yeshua's coming. Um, And so, again, he says that uh, instead of teaching them about Yahuwah, he came and was blaming them for small and little things like enlarging their fringes, claiming the uppermost rooms at feast, and praying standing in the hallways and such things, which assuredly, in, com in comparison of this great charge, the ignorance of Yahuwah, they seem to be small and insignificant matters. So the fact that Yeshua came and that he was trying to correct them on relatively small things like, you know, ex extending your fringes and making them long, um, it would make no sense for for Simon Magus to assert that the Jewish people did not know Yahuwah. Now, so this makes me wonder, this uh, enlarging their fringes, It, you know, me personally, the fringes that I put on my on my garments, they're only about three inches long. You know, you see a lot of people that have these zit seats hanging down to their knees and stuff. Um, it's just something to consider. You know, but when I read what Yeshua was saying about it, uh, making their fringes long to make a show, that really made me look at my own. Fringes, which of course you know I, I made after the manner of the of the Yahudim, and um, and so now on the corners of my shirts, you know you got the little corner on the side of your shirt. Um, it's made there so you can tuck it in your pants easy. I just put a little fringe on it. It's about three inches long, and you know it's it's braided uh, with the ten five six five, you know the name of Yahuwah, But I don't make these big. 12 inch long fringes like a lot of people see. Alright, uh, I spent like 20 minutes on one chapter. <laughs> okay, alright, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, to this, Shimon replied, from the words of your master I will refute you, because even he introdu introduces to all men a certain Elohim who was known. For although Adam knew that the Elohim 
knew the Elohim who was his creator and the maker of the world, and Enoch knew him inasmuch as he was translated by him, and Noah, since he was ordered by him to construct the ark, and although Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov and Moshe and all, even every people and all tribes know the maker of the world and confess him to be Elohim, yet your Yeshua, who appeared long after the patriarch, says, no one knows the Son but the Father, and neither knows anyone the Father but the Son, and he to whom the Son has been pleased to reveal him. Thus, because even your Yeshua confesses that there is another Elohim, incomprehensible and unknowable to all, unknown to all. So, you know, so this is something that Yeshua says in the Gospels. And honestly, like a lot of the stuff, that, to find it written in here, it really kind of... Uh, reinforces Yeshua's words in the Gospels that that this is um, that you know this hasn't been changed that, that Yeshua really did say this you know a lot of people now are questioning the uh, the Gospel of John and you know when you can read quotes in the Nazarene Acts that actually are contained in in John versus the Synoptic Gospels it really reinforces it uh, then Kepha said, You do not perceive that you are making statements in opposition to yourself. For if our Yeshua also knows him who you call the unknown Elohim, then he is not known by you alone. Yea, if our Yeshua knows him, then Moshe also, who prophesied that Yeshua should come, assuredly could not himself be ignorant of him. For he was a Navi, and he who, prophes who prophesied of the Son doubtless knew the Father. For if it is the option of the Son to reveal the, fa the Father to whom he will, then the Son, who has been with the Father from the beginning and although and through all generations, as he revealed the Father to Moshe, so also to the other Navaim. But if this if this be so, it is evident that the Father has not been known has not been unknown to any of them. But how could the Father be revealed to you, who do not believe in the Son, since the Father is known to none except him whom the Son is pleased to reveal him? But the Son reveals the Father to those who honor the Son as they honor the Father. And Shimon said, Remember that you said that Yahuwah has a Son, which is doing him wrong, for how can he have a Son unless he is subject to passions, like men or animals? But on these points there is uh, not time now to show, you profound, show your profound folly, for I hasten to make a statement concerning the immensity of the supreme light, and so now listen, my option is that there is a certain power of immense and ineffable light whose greatness may be held to be incomprehensible to what power even the maker of the world is ignorant. And Moshe, the Torah giver, and Yeshua, your master. <laughs> so we got this debate running back and forth. Is there a supreme Elohim that's above Yahuwah? Um, then Kepha, does it not seem to you to be madness that anyone should take upon himself to assert that there is another Elohim than the Elohim of all, and should say that he supposes there is a certain power, and should presume to affirm this to others before he himself is sure of what he says? Is anyone so rash as to believe your words, of which he, say, he sees that you are yourself doubtful, and to admit that there is a certain power unknown to to Elohim the Creator, and to Moshe, and to the Navaim, and Torah, and even Yeshua our Master, which power is so good that it will not make itself known to any, but to the one and only, but to one only, and that one such is one as you. Then further, if that is a new power, why does it not confer upon us some new sense, in addition to those five we already possess? That by this new sense bestowed upon us by it, we may be able to receive and understand itself which is new. Or if it cannot bestow such a sense upon us, how has it bestowed it upon you? Or if it has revealed itself to you, why not also to us? But if you of yourself understand things that are not even that not even the Navaim were able to perceive and or understand, come, tell us what each one of us is thinking now. For if there is such a ruach in you that you know these things that you are above the skies, which is unknown to all and uncomprehensible by all, much more easily do you know the thoughts of men upon the earth. But if you cannot know the thoughts of us who are standing here, how can you say that you know those things which you assert are known to me? 
so are, are known to none. So, you know, Peter's basically throwing down the gauntlet here. He says, um, chapter 51, But believe me, you could never know what light is unless you had received both vision and understanding from light itself. So also in other things. Hence, having received understanding, you are framing in imagination something greater and more sublime as if dreaming by but deriving all your hints from those five senses to which whose giver you are now you are uh, unthankful but be sure of this that until you find some new sense that is beyond those five that we enjoy we all enjoy you cannot assert you cannot assert the existence of a new elohim then shimon answered since all things that exist are in accordance with those five senses that power is much more excellent than all and cannot add anything new. Then Kepha says, It is false, for there is also a sixth sense, namely that of foreknowledge, for if those five senses are capable of knowledge, but the sixth is that of foreknowledge, and this the Navahim possessed. How then can you know an Elohim who is unknown to all, who do not know the sense of the Navi, which is that of insight? Then Shimon began to say, This power of which I speak, incomprehensible and more excellent than all, a even than of Elohim, who made the world, neither any of the Mal Malachim has known, nor the demons, nor of the Yahudim, nay, nor any creature that subsists by means of Elohim the Creator. How then could that Creator's Torah teach me that which the Creator himself did not know, since neither did Torah itself know it, that it might teach it? So, you know, uh, Simon Magus, he's basically saying that, okay, there's a supreme power that's above the Creator that the Creator doesn't even know about. None of the people know about. Moshe didn't know about. Abraham didn't know about. Noah didn't know about. Adam didn't know about. The only person that knows about this supreme being is Simon Magus himself. <clears throat> then Kepha said, I wonder how you have been able to learn more from Torah than Torah was able to know or to teach. And how do you say that you adduce proofs from Torah of, the, of those things that you are pleased to assert when you declare that neither Torah nor he who gave Torah, that is the creator of the world, knows those things of which you speak? But at this also I wonder how you, who alone know these things, should be standing here now with this all uh, circumscri circumscribed by the limits of this small court. Then Shimon, seeing Kepha and all the people laughing, said, Do you laugh, Kepha, while so great and lofty matters are under discussion? Then said Kepha, Be not enraged, Shimon, for we are doing no more than keeping our promise, for we are neither shutting our ears, as you said, nor do we take flight as soon as we heard your propound, you propound your unutterable things. But we have not even stirred from the place, for indeed... You do not even propound things that have any resemblance to truth, which might be uh, might to a certain extent frighten us. Yet, at all events, disclose to us the meaning of this saying, how from Torah you have learned of an Elohim whom Torah itself does not know, and whom he, he, he who gave Torah was ignorant. Then Shimon said, if you, have done, if you have done laughing, I will prove it by clear assertions. Then Kepha said, Assuredly, I will give over that I may learn from you how you have learned from Torah that neither Torah nor Yahuwah of Torah himself knows. So basically, <laughs> you know, here we have uh, we have Kepha employing basically he, he's taken um, Shimon's argument to the lowest count common denominator and. Uh, and, and it said that um, that basically, you know, the, he had the people to the point that they were laughing at him because his self-contradictory statements. And this is basically Peter employing something that uh, that we know is ridicule. You know, he's basically ridiculing the argument of Shimon. And this is something which I think when it's used properly, it can be a very powerful tool. Um, you know, there's a lot of times I think that we entertain 
senseless arguments and senseless discussions because we don't want to we don't want to point out how foolish they are sometimes but um, at times that's the only way you're going to get your point across so this is a uh, a very enlightening conversation that's going on and of course you know Shimon now he's pretty much on the verge of defeat <clears throat> it says then says Shimon listen it is manifest to all and ascertained in a manner of which no account can be given that there is one sovereign who is better than all uh, from whom all that is took its from whom all that is took its beginning whence also of necessity all things that are after him are subject to him as the chief and most excellent of all when therefore as I I had ascertained that the Aloha who created the world according to what Torah teaches is in many respects weak whereas weakness is utterly incomprehensible with the perfect Elohim and I saw that he is not perfect I necessarily concluded that there is another who is perfect for this Elohim as I have said according to what the writing of Torah teaches is shown to be weak in many in many things in the first place, because the man whom he formed was not able to remain such as he had intended him to be. And because he cannot be good who gave Torah to the first man, that he should eat of all the trees of paradise, but that he should not touch the tree of knowledge, and if he should eat, eat of it, he should die. For why should he forbid him to eat, and to know what is good and what is evil, that knowing he might shun the evil and choose the good? But this he did not permit, and because he did not eat, and because he did eat in violation of the commandment and discovered what is good and learned from the, for the sake of honor to cover his nakedness, for he perceived that it was unseemly to stand naked before his creator, he condemns to death him who had learned to do honor to Elohim and curses the serpent who has shown him these things. But truly, if man was to be injured by this means, why did he, take, why did he place the cause of injury in paradise at all? But... If that which he placed in paradise was good, it, um, it is not the part of one that is good to restrain from another to restrain another from good. Okay, so and this is you know this is a pretty good question. I'm sure that a lot of us have probably wondered this before. You know why should why should Yahuwah forbid the man to eat the no the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because through the knowledge of good and evil, man could know to choose the good and reject the evil. So why would why would this knowledge be something that Yahuwah would not desire for mankind? Um, and uh, I've listened to uh, several teachings by Rabbi David Foreman, uh, who is a, a Jewish um, rabbi, who makes the argument that, that what was actually said there was not that it... Um, gave them knowledge of good and evil, but that it affected their knowledge of good and evil. So that whereas in in Adam's original form, he did not see any gray areas with respect to to good and evil. You know, he uh, to him everything was very clearly good or evil. It was like true or false. So uh, you know, when it comes to, for instance voting for the lesser of two evils for Adam in his original condition he would have just seen either choice as evil so he would not have made a choice but now you know we we uh, we do things that we do things that we we think are justified because of our circumstances so you for instance you might see someone who will steal because they are poor and so they justify their thievery because they figured that they're poor, the other person is rich, so that they are justified in stealing from the rich. Um, and in the case of, and that would be a condition brought about by this knowledge of good and evil, because no longer do we have this um, understanding that stealing is wrong, period. There is no um, instance where it would be okay. Um, you know, so I, mean, I think this is a good question. We'll see how how Peter will, will uh, handle it. And you also see this. You know, why did why did Yahuwah place the uh, 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden at all in the first place? You know, I think this is a a question that that any you know Bible student has had. I'm sure I can. I think I can remember even thinking this whenever I was in you know Sunday school when I was a kid. You know, why why did Yahuwah make the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil if he didn't want anybody eating from it? So uh, it says, thus then, since he who made the man in the world is according to what Torah relates imperfect, we are given to understand without doubt that there is another who is perfect. For it is of necessity that there is one most excellent of all, on whose account also every creature keeps its rank, whence also I knowing that, that it is in every way necessary that there be some, uh, someone more benign and more powerful than that imperfect Elohim who gave Torah, understanding what is perfect from comparison of the imperfect, understood that understood even from the scripture that Elohim who is not mentioned there. And in this way I was able, O Kepha, to learn from Torah what Torah did not know. But even if Torah had not given indications from which it might be gathered that the Elohim who made the world is imperfect, it was still possible for me to infer those, to infer from those evils that are done in this world and are not corrected that either the Creator is powerless if he cannot correct what is done amiss or else if he does not wish to remove the evils that he himself is evil. But if he neither can, if he neither can nor will, that he is neither powerful nor good, and from this it cannot be concluded that, that, there, that there is another Elohim more excellent and more powerful than all. If you have aught to say to this, say on. So, um, so that I think this is a good point also to address because this is something that um, that you hear people mention sometimes. Let's see if I can. Uh, we go here. And I'm, you know, I've heard non-believers say things like this before. So, you know, if, uh, you know, why would Yahuwah allow this or that to happen? If he, if he would allow that and not, and not fix it, you know, why would he not, um, you know, how can he be truly good if he allows bad things to happen? You know, why did he, why did he allow my, you know, son or daughter to die? Why did he allow you know, this person to be murdered or whatever. And, um, and so this is a question that we hear a lot. And I think Peter is getting ready to answer that. And so in the next video, we will continue and we will see what Peter's response is to this challenge by Simon Magus. So, Shalom.